This message was presented at the GYC 2016 conference, when all has been heard, in Houston, Texas. For other resources like this, visit us online at www.gycweb.org. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Say it with me now. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. And so I say, God is good. And all the time, try it again, God is good. And all the time, let me hear the ladies, God is good. And all the time, where are the men, God is good. And all the time, the family of God, God is good. And all the time, as they say in Kenya, and that's his nature. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Happy Sabbath to you. How did you sleep? You slept well. How many of you dreamed of Jesus? May I see your hands? Nobody dreamed of Jesus. It's all right. He has no grudge against you. He loves you. Do you realize you and I are awake and alive now because of the mercies of Christ? The Bible says, in Him we live and move and have our being in Christ. In Matthew 5, 45, the Bible says, For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Because of that verse, every day I ask God, be merciful to people who are suffering, even for those who don't follow you. Because that exercise of mercy may lead them to follow you. I ask God every day, be merciful to those who are suffering, including those who do not follow you. Why? Because your word says, He maketh His Son to rise on the good and on the evil. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And as long as probation continues, you can pray. For those who are suffering, you can pray for the evil, for the evil doers and sinners, because God's grace still extends to them. I'm happy to see you. Let me thank you for your cooperation yesterday. I rebuked you rather sharply. None of you rebelled, as far as I could see. I complained about the constant walking around, and I believe you made a concentrated effort to stay in your seats. I want you to repeat that, particularly on these holy hours. Discipline yourselves. Stay where you are. I won't be long. I'm not given enough time to be long. <laughs> Who is with us for the very first time since GYC began? May I see your hand? Very first time. God bless you. God bless you. I mean, the very first time this week. God bless you. God bless you wherever you are. And I mean it when I say God bless you, it's a word a prayer made up of three words which I offer with my eyes open, God bless you. Now, is there anyone with us now, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, may I see your hand? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Just move your hand so I can, ah, God bless you, God bless you. Anybody else? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist, but you're with us. Just move your hand so I can see it. Anyone, anyone? In my mind, ah, I see you way in the back. God bless you. And I mean that with concentrated seriousness. God bless you. Now, say amen for our guests. Amen. Ah, that's weak. Say it again. Amen. One more time. Amen. God is good. All the 
all the time. Yes, I love God. How many of you love God? Can I see your hand? Was that the truth? Well, confirm it by raising your hand again. Ah, God bless you. You know, God is the God who confirms. He gave two dreams to Pharaoh. And Joseph explained to Pharaoh, the dream was given twice, that it might be established of God. So when you ask God for something, and you think He's leading you in a direction, you say, God, confirm it. God is a God who confirms. What does the Bible say? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Ask God, is this the man for me? If you think he said yes, Father, confirm it. Our subject for this morning, a tsunami warning. What did I say? What was our subject yesterday? You're a little slow. What was our subject the first morning? I knew you'd get that one quickly. All right. LOL. I love you. I said I love you. I wasn't fishing, but uh, thanks for that. No, the Bible says, this is my commandment that you do what? Love one another. So I am obeying God. I love you, not because I am commanded, but because you're so lovable and you look so nice in those dresses God gave you and those expensive suits. Uh, thank you very much. Now, before I begin, since you're in a mood to cooperate, what's this? What's that? What's the proper name for this? What is this? What is this not? It is not the holy iPhone. So please, put it away as I'm putting mine away. Turn it off. Now, very seriously, every time I make that request, there's some person saying, I don't care what he says, I will leave my phone on. Don't do that. Practice cooperate. By the way, any time a leader of the church, especially, asks you to do something, if it is not a sin and it does not affect your conscience, try to cooperate. If it is not a sin, and it does not offend your biblically informed conscience. Try to cooperate. All phones off and iPads. Open your Bible. Who can recite all 66 books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Oh, oh my, how nice. How n come. Come. You raise your hands, come. How do you get up here? I don't know, come, this is my time, you come. Find somewhere to get up here and come. There's some stairs around here somewhere, come. Next time someone asks you a question, be careful how you raise your hand. <laughs> come, sister, come, I'll wait for you. Why she comes, let's recite the fourth commandment again. Remember the Sabbath day. Come on, say, keep it. Now this side, you continue, come on. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Not bad. Keep going. Stop. Thou. Uh huh. Mm hmm. You're a little weak. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Pick it up. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All together. And of all the commandments, that one is commandment one. Did you hear what I said? Of all the commandments, that one is commandment one. Sister, what's your name? Alexis. You look like a nice person. Are you married? No, sir. Well, learn to cook and you'll get a husband. <laughs> all right. <laughs> the books of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Go ahead. The whole world is watching you. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Joba, Micah, Nahum, Abakuk, Sevaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, um, Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, Timon, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, Timothy. Timothy, 
Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, um, first and second Peter, um, first, second, third John, Jude, Revelation. Amen. Ah, ah, you can take that back. God bless you. What's your name you said? Alexis. Alexis, God bless you. God Thank bless you. God bless Alexis. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say what? Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. By the way, that's a very serious request. I make it every time I stand. My words cannot save you. The words of God will transform your life. The words of God will bring back that child that left the church. The words of God will heal your marriage. The words of God will improve your health if, of course, we accept the words of God into our lives. Pray and say, God, put your words in that man's mouth. And favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, I surrender myself into your hands. If I've offended you in any way, forgive me, dear God. Father, use me as a tool, as an instrument. Father, if necessary, use me like a disposable razor. But just use me first, dear Father. Put your words in my mouth, dear God. Help me to speak with boldness, with fearlessness, with courage, but with compassion, Father, for I too am a sinner. Bless this beautiful congregation, dear God. Everyone you love, you sent your Son to die for them. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, bless them with the presence of your Spirit, Father, the Spirit that enlightens the mind, the Spirit that guides us into truth. In a very special way, bless all those who are not Seventh-day Adventists. We are so honored by their presence, dear God, and hasten the day when they will say, yes, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. Bless this entire service to your glory exclusively, Father, and to our blessing, I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Acts chapter 4, we shall read from verse 34. Our subject, a tsunami warning. Acts 4, reading from verse 34. While you're searching for Acts chapter 4, there are some personalities in the New Testament that always pop into the mind when we think of outstanding servants of God. We think preeminently, of course, of Jesus Christ. But he's in a class by himself, so we will exclude him. Of all the New Testament characters that are outstanding, who pops into your mind? The Apostle Paul. Stephen, the first martyr, we think of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, but there is a man that is not frequently mentioned, and I want him to be the person who introduces this message this morning, and that man is called Barnabas. Our subject, a tsunami warning. Let's learn a little about Barnabas. Acts 4, reading from verse 34. Before we read, let me set it up. In the early church, whoever had a need have that need met by the generosity of other church members. Let me say it again. No one in the early church suffered because all other church members came together and gave what they had to meet the needs of those who were in crisis. And so verse 34 says, Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And so the Bible says those who were wealthy, they sold land, they sold houses, they sold to meet the needs of those in the church less fortunate. Ah, how the church would be different today if we function that way. And Joses, verse 37, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is, by inter which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. We are introduced to Barnabas as a generous man, a soft-hearted member of the church who felt that the need of a member in crisis was his personal responsibility. Let me say it again. Some of us have this attitude, that's your problem. No, when a member of the church suffers, it is all of our problems. Somebody say amen. amen. 
Barnabas, his mindset was, your suffering is my problem. He sold land and brought the money and gave it to the apostles. Now, some of us today, we will make contributions, but we want to decide how the money will be used. Mm -hmm. Those early church members, they gave the money and they trusted the apostles to distribute the money as the Holy Ghost led them. Do not use your money to deliberately try to determine what the church should do. If you're convicted to give, give. And leave it up to the Spirit of God to guide those to whom the money is entrusted. If that's clear, say amen. Don't use your wealth as a weapon to whip the church into compliance with your desires. Barnabas was a giving man. Generous man. Let's look at Barnabas again. We go to Acts chapter 9. We read from verse 26. This is the chapter in which Paul, or Saul as he was then, collides with Jesus Christ. He's knocked off his horse. He's made blind. He goes through conversion. He meets with the church at uh, Damascus. Now he preaches in Damascus. His life is threatened. He leaves Damascus and he comes to Jerusalem. Verse 26, Acts 9, a tsunami warning. And when Paul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. This man used to arrange for the killing of those who followed Christ. He had a reputation as a very cruel man. If you go to verse 1 of Acts chapter 9, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, he was constantly seeking out Christians to have them murdered, killed, destroyed. The apostles knew of Saul, so when he came to Jerusalem and tried to join them, the Bible says they were afraid. Verse 26, 27, sorry. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had met the Lord or had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus Christ. Barnabas took Saul when all the other apostles were terrified of Saul and Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and said, this man is okay. We have a generous man. We have a giving man. We have a fearless man. He went by himself, got Saul, and took him and put the minds of the other disciples at rest. When Stephen was martyred, the church at Jerusalem scattered, Cyprus, uh, Antioch, Cyrene. And as they ran, they preached. And their preaching had effect. And in Acts 11, when the church at Jerusalem, because the leaders remained in Jerusalem, when they heard what was going on in the area of uh, Antioch, the Bible says in verse 22, they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now Barnabas was sent by the church to assess what was going on in the area of Cyprus, Cyrene, and Antioch. Now, when the church chooses a man to assess a spiritual situation, the church chooses a man who is grounded in the Word, who is grounded in the writings of the prophet of the Lord, Ellen White, who knows how to discern. In 1900, September 13 to September 23, there was a camp meeting in Muncie, Indiana. The church had heard of a disastrous movement called the Holy Flesh Movement, which essentially said to prepare for translation, this body had to go through some suffering. It had to go through the Garden of Gethsemane experience that through the suffering, the flesh might be perfected in readiness for translation. And at those services, the people worked themselves into a frenzy. Loud music was played, just like in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And people would fall down and faint. And then they were declared to have passed through the Garden of Gethsemane experience, and they were now sinless in the flesh. 
and ready for translation. When the church heard of that, the church sent two men to investigate, just as the church at Jerusalem sent Barnabas to investigate the evangelism going on in Cyprus, Cyrene, and Antioch. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1900 sent two men, S. N. Haskell and A. J. Breed, to confront this era called the Holy Flesh. But the point I'm trying to stress, when you send someone to assess a situation, to meet it and to confront it, you must send a man or a woman who can defend the teachings of the church. Can you say amen? They sent Barnabas. He knew the word. He was a man of balance, a man of discernment, a man who could see the workings of the enemy where no one else could, a man of fearlessness. They sent Barnabas. Let's look at Barnabas a little more. Acts 13, reading from verse 1. Acts 13, verse 1, our subject, a tsunami warning. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have what? Yes, I've called them now. By the way, let me uh, digress meaningfully and briefly. There are some among us who believe the Holy Ghost is not an intelligent personality. When you hear that, go in the other direction. The Holy Ghost is fully divine. The Holy Ghost is God. I didn't say the Holy Ghost was the Father. I said the Holy Ghost is God. Jesus is God. The Father is God. Don't keep giving me these anemic amens. Say amen. The Holy Ghost is God. The Holy Ghost is divine. The Bible says the Holy Ghost said. He communicated with those prophets and teachers and he selected Barnabas and Saul, not Saul and Barnabas. If you read the early history of the Apostle Paul, he traveled initially with Barnabas, but they are mentioned as Barnabas and Saul first, meaning at some point Barnabas was a mentor to Saul. How do you mentor the Apostle Paul unless you're Jesus? Barnabas was a mentor to Saul. The Holy Ghost hand-picked Barnabas. I am stressing this. Generous, soft-hearted, loved the brethren, fearless, could defend the truth against error, hand-picked by the Spirit of God for a work that God desired he and Saul should do. This is Barnabas. Say amen for Brother Barnabas. Amen. Let's learn some more about Barnabas. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. We'll read from verse 11. Thank you for holding your seats. I just thought I should remind you to continue to be nice. We forget very quickly. What book did I say? Galatians, what chapter? What verse? Verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, or Jerusalem, I withstood him, how? To the face. Why? Because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. What is Paul saying? Peter, that great apostle, would mingle with the unbelievers, uh, not the unbelievers, the Gentiles, when no Jews were around. When the Jews showed up, Peter backed off. And Paul didn't like that. When they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now, listen to verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Now, we have a chain of events. Listen to verse 13 microscopically. Read it with me if you have the King James Version. And the other Jews did what? Dissembled or acted hypocritically. How? What's the next word? Likewise. What does that mean? Just like Peter. 
Follow me closely. One man acted hypocritically, and a group followed that man. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Listen to me carefully. You have one of two options. Your presence on this earth can be the reason why some people go to hell or heaven. There are people in your classroom, in your college, your academy, your university, who may end up in hell or heaven because of you. All the Jews present, watching Peter's behavior, followed him. Now we'll reread verse 13 and come to the sad conclusion of that verse. The other Jews also dissembled likewise with him in so much. What does that mean? To such an extent. Finish the verse for me. Barnabas also, finish the verse, was what? Carried away. Finish the verse with the deception. Now, what's our subject? You're too slow. What's our subject? Tsunami one. What does the tsunami do? How many of you are from Indonesia? Ah, God bless my beautiful Indonesians. I love Indonesia. I've been here about six times. I want to go six more times. <laughs> what happened December 26, 2004, I believe it was? A tsunami. Any of my friends from Indonesia from Banda Aceh? You are from Banda Aceh. It perhaps received the worst effects of that tsunami. It washed away buildings. A few years ago, in northern Japan, there was a tsunami. You know the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant? The tsunami came over a 30-foot wall. Washed away villages. Influence is a tsunami. Are you sleeping with your eyes open? Did you hear what I said? What did I just say? Influence is a tsunami. Barnabas, that strong man, that man that the denomination can trust to confront the, uh, what was going on in Antioch, Cyrene, Cyprus, when I say confront, to determine whether it was genuine or not. That man who was not afraid of the Apostle Paul. That man who was generous, that man who was in the early life of Paul's ministry, a mentor to Paul, that man, the Holy Ghost hand-picked, he was swept away by a tsunami of influence. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, in so much the hypocrisy was so great that Barnabas, now the Bible singles out Barnabas to emphasize the degree to which Peter's negative behavior affected the Jews and the ripple effect that reached to Barnabas. Barnabas should have stood alone like Paul because Paul saw it and he was not swept away. Are you listening to me? Paul saw it, verse 14, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Paul was watching this. And he said, this isn't right. When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, Paul confronted this mass hypocrisy. He was a wall to stem this tsunami. My young friends and my not-so-young friends, don't consider yourselves immune to the tsunami of the influence of people around you. Unless you think you're stronger than Barnabas. Unless you think you have more gifts than Barnabas had. If Barnabas could be swept away, of course not permanently, I'm sure he repented, you and I can be swept away if we are not careful. We need to learn to take personal, individual stands for God. Amen. Nothing to do with the crowd, by the way. 
for those of you in positions of authority, my clock doesn't function, so I don't know how much time I have left, and I'm happy for that. <laughs> we need to learn to take individual stands. Listen to Joshua. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood are the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, pause, listen to Joshua, as for me and my house, Joshua could have said, as for my house, and that would have included him, the house meaning family. But Joshua identifies himself as an individual in his family. As for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord, meaning if my house chooses not to serve God, if my wife leaves God, if my in-laws leave God, if my children leave God, I will serve the Lord. How many of you will say, if the whole world leaves God, I'll be faithful to God? Can I see your hand? If the whole world leaves Jesus, I'll be faithful to Christ. We need that mind. Jesus had that mind. That's why you and I can be saved. Amen. Why do I say that? When Christ was confronted in the Garden of Gethsemane, or the, yes, the Garden of Gethsemane, by the Roman soldiers led by Brother Judas, the Bible says in Mark chapter 14, verse 50, of the disciples, they all forsook him and fled. Peter James, John, his inner circle, they ran. Listen to me carefully. The only person you can depend on absolutely is Jesus. God bless your wife and your husband and your mother and your father. The only person you can trust absolutely is Jesus. He does not run when things get hot. The Bible says they all forsook him and fled, and Jesus held his ground because Christ could have run. Now he's on the cross. Same book of Mark. Verse 34, chapter 15. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted. Finish the verse. My God. Come on, say it. My God. My God. Why hast thou forsaken me? For a while the Father turned away from the Son. The disciples were gone. The Father turned away. Jesus was on that cross. What word do I need to use now? Alone. He could have been swept away by the influence of the departing 11 disciples vanishing in the night of Gethsemane. But love for you and the Father held him rooted to the ground. When the Father turned away, Christ could have left that cross because he and the Father had never been separated before and the Father swore that this rending of the Godhead, you take a garment and you rip, you tear. That is what happened on the cross when the Father turned away and the Father swore it would never happen again, but it happened. Let's reason together. When the Father turned away, what do you think the Holy Ghost did? Can the Holy Ghost go against the Father? What do you think the Holy Ghost did? Turned away. When the Father turned away and the Holy Ghost turned away, what do you think the angels did? And Christ was on that cross, give me the word, alone. Listen to this verse. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. Christ by himself. The disciples gone. The father turned away. The spirit turned away. The angels turned away. Christ on that cross alone not being swept away by the tsunami of people leaving him. And he stayed because he loves you. Forget the person next to you. He loves you. 
an individual decision to stay. We must understand the importance of individual decisions. When God made Adam, just listen to the word, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When that occurred, Eve did not exist. <clears throat> so when Adam was made, Eve was not around. It was Adam and God. That's it. When Eve was made, Genesis 2, 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept now. Could God have left Adam awake to watch the creation of Eve? Yes or no? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. But notice the language of the Bible, and the Lord God caused what kind of sleep? <clears throat> what does sleep represent in the Bible? Death. Death. In a certain sense, to all intents and purposes, Adam was dead. He had nothing to do with God's interaction with Eve. Eve had nothing to do with God's interaction with Adam. So when Adam opened his eyes, who did he see? God. When Eve opened her eyes, whom did she see? God. By the way, young people, see God first before you see a boyfriend. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Nobody's listening. Listen to me. See God first before you see a boyfriend or girlfriend or somebody else's girlfriend. <laughs> see God. Because when you see God, now you have proper perspective. You have divine GPS to guide you. See God first before you buy that house. See God first before you choose a career. See God first before you decide to have an eighth child. See God. What's the word? First. God made Adam. Eve was not around. God made Eve. Adam was not around. Why? Because God begins at the individual level. Until you understand the importance of individual decision for God, you and I are at risk of being swept away by the tsunami of the influence of others. Your church decides to rebel against a general conference and you swept away. Your church board decides to rebel against whomever you swept away. Your classroom teacher decides to teach uh, that uh, Jesus is not divine. All the other students believe it. You're swept away. Why? Because we like to be part of something. Some of you listening to me, deep in your heart, you want to serve God, but you want to please your friends. Deep in your heart, you do not like what you're becoming, but you want to please your friends. You know you ought to stop that behavior on Friday night. You want to please your friends. Ask God for the courage to make an individual decision to do what is right in the sight of God. <clears throat> in the judgment, you stand before God by yourself. You don't take your parents. You don't take the friends that led you into drugs. You do not take the friend that led you into sexual immorality. You stand before God by yourself. My brothers and sisters, this message this morning is a tsunami warning. In Child Guidance, page 201, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes, Every course of action has a twofold character and importance. It is virtuous or vicious, right or wrong, according to the motive which prompts it. A wrong action by frequent repetition leaves a permanent mark upon the mind of the actor and also on the minds of those that are connected with him in any relation, either spiritual or temporal. What is she saying? When you are connected to an evildoer, his or her behavior affects you. And so she writes in Councils for the Church, page 312, paragraph 3. Listen carefully. The society of unbelievers will do us no harm if we mingle with them for the purpose of connecting them with God. Here's how it ends. 
and are strong enough spiritually to withstand their influence. Amen. Every person on the face of the earth is a tsunami. It can be good or it can be bad. Let the tsunami of your influence wash people to Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. There are men in graveyards right now who were there because of the influence of a friend. There are men, young men, in prison because of the influence of friends. Come on, join us. And you can't say no. You join to be part of the group. Prison. There are people in rehabilitation programs now because of the tsunami influence of a friend. There are young people who dress the way they dress because of the tsunami influence of those on MTV or whatever the station is. Take a stand for Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. You see, you and Christ, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose how many? One. That's the one on one, you see. Doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which was lost until he find it. So when he finds it, it is the shepherd and the sheep, no one else. One to one. You know you should be baptized. But your friends are laughing at you, and so you change your mind. You know you ought to obey your parents, but your friends laugh at you because they don't. You change your mind. You're trying to act like a demon when God is trying to make you a saint because you're friends. You know, parents, I'm sure you'll uh, understand what I'm about to say. At a certain age, the only thing that matters to the youth are friends. My friends have a phone. Why don't I have one? My friends come in at 12 at night. Why do I have to come in at 9? My friends wear short skirts. Why do I have to wear a gown? My friends, uh, whatever, go to the theater. Why do I only go to church? My friends are allowed to use some vegetarian curse words. Why do I have to talk like Jesus? It is always my friends, my friends. My, and perhaps mothers and fathers, you're sick to death of hearing my friends. That's a tsunami. My friends, Jesus is a friend. Come on, say amen. amen. The Holy Ghost is a friend, huh? Amen. If Christ is your friend, the Father is your friend. Amen. They are friends of heavenly origin amen. with whom you can associate. Amen. My young brother, hiding in the crowd, you need to stop what you're doing. Stop it no matter what your friends say. Leave that gang. Leave those friends who are leading you in the wrong direction. Amen. Young lady, you know you're troubled deep in your heart. What you're doing is wrong. As you assess your life the past six months, you realize I am heading in the wrong direction. God sent you here to change directions. Amen. Older man, older lady, whoever you are, break the influence that friends have on you if it is negative by clinging to Jesus Christ. Make a decision like Daniel. Amen. I will pray only to God, even if it means facing lions. Make a decision like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even though they are named together, they made three individual decisions. Don't follow the crowd. Amen. Follow Jesus. Amen. This message this morning is a tsunami warning. Amen. It applies to all ages. You adults, putting yourself in the financial debt to get a house as big as your neighbor's house. Putting yourself in debt to buy a car that your in-laws drive. Putting yourself in debt to keep up with the Joneses and the Smiths. And the Garcias. The tsunami of influence affects every single age. Not just the youth. When we hear the term peer pressure, we think only of the youth. No, it applies to every living being. We do things because we see others do them. I am saying this morning, change that attitude and do what you do because the Bible says do it or not do it. 
And so this morning I'll ask you, and I want you to answer me with honesty, unmixed honesty. Do you desire a one-to-one relationship with your God? How many will say yes? Can I show? Yeah, one-to-one. Hands down. Now this one will take some courage and guts. Well, not guts. They don't like the word guts in Australia. So I, I force, forgive me, Australia. Who, who will have gumption and courage? Listen to the call. There's someone listening to me. You are being wrongly influenced by your friends. Listen to me. Right now, as you listen, you are being wrongly influenced by your friends. If that applies to you, stand up. Ah, I like courage. Come, come, come. It's easy to come when you're standing. Come, come, come. Come right here. You are being wrongly influenced and you know it. Come. Come quickly. I have about three minutes left, I think. Come. You are being wrongly influenced and you know it. When the Israelites came out of the wilderness, God told them, do not intermingle with the heathen. They will turn you from me. They'll turn you. Why? Because we're naturally that way by birth. And so evil appeals to us more quickly than good. My call is, right where you sit and stand, you know you are being negatively influenced by your friends. Come. I'm talking to all ages. There's a behavior you're engaging in because of your friends. Come and break that. By the power that broke death, Jesus Christ's resurrection power is the power He makes available to us to deliver us from any bondage. What's the call? I am right now, I know I'm in a situation, I am negatively influenced by friends. Come. Come quickly. You're young. But I'm calling all ages. Negatively influenced. I have another call for you. Some of you, you know you need to be baptized. You haven't made the decision yet, but you know you should be. One of the deceptions of the devil is, wait until you know everything. That'll never happen. Only God can claim that. You know enough that God wants you baptized, be a member of his body. The sacramental entrance into Christ is baptism. And if you'll say right where you stand or wherever you are over there, Father, I will at least make a public decision, let heaven and earth see where my mind is, a decision I am willing to be baptized. Willing. If you have that willingness, let me see your hand. I'm willing. Okay, I see that hand. Keep it up. Someone come and scan something. Willing. Keep that hand up. Now, if you're in the congregation, come. You raise your hand, I'm willing, come. If you're in the congregation, willing, come. I am willing. We're looking for willingness. In other words, is your heart in that direction? Come. I am willing to be baptized. Come. You heard Christ came to be baptized. John said, no. Jesus insisted. I'm willing. We're looking for willingness. Who does this scanning? Come and scan. Somebody else come. My apologies to 3ABN if I've exceeded my time. God bless you, Sammy. Come. Come stand right up front. I'm willing. I'm looking for willingness. You know, the spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. God understand. Bring me that willing spirit, says God. I'm willing. You come. Somebody else, quickly. Come. I'm willing. I'm willing. I have a second call. I was baptized, but I've drifted from God. Not made a mistake. I have drifted. And if the church knew the life I lived, I'd be this fellowship immediately, if not sooner. I have drifted. I need to renew that contract with Jesus through rebaptism. Come. I need to be rebaptized. Come. My life has been anything but representative of God. I'm not saying I made a mistake. Your life has been an insult, disgrace to God. I need to start all over with God by rebaptism. Come. In Acts chapter 19. First seven verses, 12 disciples were rebaptized. Evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2, Ellen White writes, When a soul is truly reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. Anyone else? God bless you. Is the scanning going on? Isn't there someone supposed to scan these things? Okay. 
You want them to follow you? Ah, where? Right in the back. Okay, listen to me carefully. You won't miss anything. When I offer the benediction, follow sisters. Two attractive sisters not listening to me. Okay. <laughs> Stay right where you are. Follow them right there so they'll know who's baptism and who's just a recommitment. Are you following me? Do not change your mind for any reason. Now, I have to pray first, but the Sammy, stay where you are. Let me pray first. Let me pray first. Okay, let me pray first. Anyone else? Baptism, I'm willing. I need to be rebaptized. Come. All right, I see your hand. Come. We're going to go to the back. Anybody else? Now, third call. There's someone listening. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist, but you've been blessed. You'd like some more information to understand what we believe? Raise your hand. Ah, okay, we have one. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You'd like some more information. Raise your hand, wherever you are. Move it so I can see it. I would like some more. Ah, okay, God bless you. Make that known to them in the back so we can get you information that will change your lives. And then God can use you to change other people's lives. Three calls. I'm willing to be baptized. I need to be rebaptized. I need to know more about what Adventists believe. And of course, I'm negatively influenced. I need to break that. Anyone else coming? Anyone else? You'll never have this privilege again. Never. You may go to other GYCs, other conferences. They will never be exactly like this. Never. Come. Come, sister. Never be just like this again. Never. Come. Baptism. Rebaptism. Break the negative influence of friends. And I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, but I want some information. I like what I've heard. I want information. Come. Now I'm going to pray. And listen to me carefully. Follow those two ladies right to the back. They'll take care of you. Everyone standing. By the way, when appeal is made, this is not a spectator sport. You must pray. Because every time a preacher makes an appeal, the devil makes one. His appeal from God, come, the devil, stay. You must pray. It is not a spectator sport to see who moved. Heads bowed, eyes closed. While I pray out loud, you pray in your hearts. God of heaven and earth, if I have preached badly, forgive me. If I have been hard on your beloved, forgive me, dear God. You know what's in my heart? A desire to see people follow you and come to you. Dear God, please, in the name of Jesus Christ, stand by your word. You said in First P uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You said in Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. You said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, that's what you said. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man. He should lie. Father, you said those words. Now, defend your honesty to God. Grant your spirit to those who've come with such power that the decisions they've made now, no earthly power will change. Show us, dear God, how eager you are to save a soul. Stand by your word, I ask with earnestness but with respect. Do everything heaven can to guarantee, to secure, and to save those who answer the calls. Dear God, in mercy, save us. Sustain us. Now as your sons and daughters file to the back, let unseen angels walk with them, dear God. Let no power on earth change their minds. Hear this humble prayer. Save us when you come, Father. Save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say loudly, Amen. Say it again. Amen. Say it again. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Now listen to me carefully. Follow those ladies. This message was presented at the GYC 2016 conference, when all has been heard, in Houston, Texas. GYC, a supporting ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, seeks to inspire young people to be Bible-based, Christ-centered, and soul-winning Christians. For other resources like this, 
visit us online at www.gycweb.org.